Hey, what's up, folks? In this video, I'll be covering the final round of the 2021 Vegas Open. And um, yeah, this was the money round because this is the last round. And at this point, I'm actually, I think, somewhat behind everyone else. I'm on five out of eight. Uh, my opponent, Feeding Master Dalton Breen, had six out of eight. Um, and there were a couple other players uh, like with six, six and a half, even seven. So I definitely needed to win this game to kind of have any chance uh, of winning a prize. And uh, Dalton's actually a friend of mine, friend of the dojo. So it was um, actually kind of fun to be able to play him in such an important game. But um, yeah, definitely a very, very uh, tough battle. And um, one that I, I'll just say, you know, from the start, I, I definitely deserved uh, to lose this game. Um, so starts out uh, knight of three, knight of six, g3, g6, and b3. So um, white here actually repeats a similar thing to what I faced against Grandmaster Nizhnik in the round seven video, this kind of double Fianchetto setup against the King's Indian. And um, here the opening goes a little bit differently um, with white kind of choosing to Fianchetto first. And um, the previous game could transpose if I had played like d6 here, d4, let's say knight d7 and white played um, castles here or c4, we could very easily get a direct transposition to my game against Nizhnik. Um, so that was definitely a possibility, but I decided to switch it up. Um, I've seen this idea played in similar positions to just go a5 and a4 uh, against this early b3 setup. And I figured I might as well try it. I mean, we had like almost zero time to prepare for this last game so i figured okay might just be kind of a good <laughs> a good try to kind of get us out of uh charted waters early on and kind of force both players to like think from the, for themselves from the get-go um so i tried this move and i think it kind of makes sense like we're just trying to play a4 and be a little bit annoying to white um but it definitely doesn't actually turn out so well here um because white plays c4 and uh, I advance with a4, uh, and then uh, Dalton just goes b4, which definitely surprised me at first, but um, eventually I realized, you know, his ideas, he just wants to fix the structure with a3, and then bring the knight out to c3, and then maybe one day even just take this pawn. Uh, so I was trying to figure out, like, what to do, like, how to actually proceed from here, and I feel like uh, Ultimately, what I did with a4 is just kind of dubious because I think white can get actually very comfortable setup. So what I should have done is actually just wait on this move and just develop with like d6, knight d7, kind of go back to like normal moves, c6, uh, and then maybe one day I'll push a4 when when the time is right. And it will just be kind of like a very typical uh, type of game for this King's Indian uh, like double Fianchetto setup. Um, so yeah, after a4, b4, I start with d6, because usually black is trying to play for uh, e5 here. Uh, and then if white goes d4, then this is somewhat committal, and I was actually considering different moves here. Um, one of them being c5, which I thought was kind of interesting to just fight against the center this way. The point being that if white ever takes and, let's say, advances, then black can kind of put a lot of pressure on the center. The move like e6, and I... I thought this would be kind of an interesting thing to do. Um, on c5, I, I'm pretty sure white should just go a3 here and just kind of keep the tension, and I'm, I'm thinking white should definitely be better in this position anyway, but yeah, just kind of some lines I thought that might happen. Um, but white ends up playing queen to c2, which was definitely surprising for me. The move I was most afraid of actually was just the simple a3, just starting with this one, because white cannot really bring out the knight uh, as long as black has a3 available, I would love to get my pawn to a3, so I thought white should just start with this one and then just threaten to play here and take the pawn, and black would have to kind of figure something out. Like during the game, I was thinking maybe I can go knight d7, knight b6, which didn't seem ideal because white can always um, hit with uh, c5, and that could be kind of unpleasant. It's also considering maybe I'll just try to play e5, e4, and maybe just sacrifice the pawn for uh, development. Ultimately, I was just going to decide uh, if white had, had played a3, but yeah, I wasn't too confident about my chances already uh, at this moment. So queen c2, I play e5, d3, and now I'm starting to kind of understand white setup. He wants to play like almost like an English opening, and then again, a3, knight c3. Um, so I play rook e8, white castles, and yeah, here I decide to go e4. I mean, this was kind of the whole point of rook e8 was to, let's say, threaten this break with e4. Um, 
using the fact that white is kind of too slow to play knight c3 or knight d2 here, because then again, that would allow a3. So then I, I think black kind of gets what uh, they're playing for with this pawn's a3, and then can maybe fight for some kind of initiative here. But um, yeah, instead white just castles, and he lets me play e4, so I decide to make this move. Um, takes, and I thought about knight takes e4 here, um, but I ultimately concluded that I just felt like black was just going to be worse here after the trade of dorks for bishops, and he can go queen to b2 check, and again, he can play a3, and yeah, I just felt like um, white is just going to have a very comfortable game. So I decided to take with the rook, and there's some tactics here, like, of course, we have to see that if bishop takes f6, uh, we can just recapture, and then the rook on a1 is hanging. And so this, I wasn't exactly sure that it's 100% working for black, but I didn't really see what white can do here. And then I just want to develop knight c6, bishop f5. And yeah, as long as I can keep my darks for bishop on the board, I felt like black should be uh, at least okay here. Um, and instead, after rook takes e4, white really surprised me with this move knight h4. But this move actually makes a lot of sense. Um, because if allowed, black's next move is going to be bishop f5, which could be just very unpleasant for white's queen. And uh, during the game, I actually thought he might play knight d4, um, but then analyzing afterwards, I realized, well, actually, there's a3 here. So this is why knight d4 wasn't played, because black can get a3, and if knight takes a3, there's rook takes, and uh, black is winning uh, two knights four for the rook, and probably doing really, really well there. Um, so knight h4 gets the rook out of the center, but also stops black from playing bishop f5, and yeah, I actually think it's quite a quite a decent move. So rook e8, now white finally plays a3. Uh, I played knight d7. And yeah, at this point, I'm definitely feeling like my position is pretty much just worse. Because I'm like lacking space. We haven't really traded any pieces uh, yet. And yeah, I don't really have like any, any super clear targets. But I put my knight on d7 because I'm trying to maybe go knight to b6 or maybe knight e5. And just kind of put pressure on this uh, c4 pawn. So e3. I think white has a lot of moves here, and actually at this point we're both already starting to spend quite a bit of time as, um, yeah, we pretty quickly actually end up in, in uh, time trouble in this game. Um, so I go queen e7, rook d1, uh, knight e5. Yeah, instead of rook d1, again, white had a lot of moves here, but the main thing that was kind of holding my position together is that knight c3 could always be met with knight b6, and at least I can get some counterplay against the c4 pawn. So I felt like this would not be very clear. And if white does something like c5, knight c4, then I thought I'm always at least okay here because I'm getting uh, counterplay just by attacking this bishop and, and looking for uh, chances on the diagonal. So I was okay against knight c3, but I think knight d2 and white is just clearly better. Um, rook d1 felt like a reasonable move to me during the game, but later, you know, white kind of uh, spends an extra tempo. So probably uh, moving the rook elsewhere. So probably knight d2, I think first was maybe more accurate for white. Um, I ended up playing knight e5, knight d2, uh, c6. And this move, I just felt like I have to make at some point because bishop on c8 needs to be uh, developed. Rook a c1. And yeah, here I think I started burning lots of time because um, I like need to come up with a plan and um, I can play bishop g4 and, and score a free tempo, but after like rook e1, I, I just wasn't sure what the follow-up is. And in the meantime, white wants to play h3 and then maybe f4 and e4. And if anything, I've actually helped white's rook get to a better square. Um, so yeah, I wasn't really sure what to do because I'm worried at this point that like white is just going to start rolling the pawns forward and uh, completely run me over. Um, so, but I also have to like keep developing. <laughs> so I, I don't know what to do. I decide to go for bishop e6. And I was kind of hoping to provoke some complications here because it does look like white can play c5. And this break looks very tempting because the knight is um, under pressure. But then the idea would be to now play bishop to g4. And then if c takes d6, I think I calculated bishop takes d1, hitting white's queen. And I felt like these complications uh, were going to be at least okay for black. Uh, like I'm winning the exchange here after bishop takes e5. It's still complicated, but I didn't think that this was going to be worse and maybe even uh, better. I didn't investigate this one too, too carefully, but yeah, it just felt like white wasn't going to have enough. And for example, I can go like bishop e3 here. And um, yeah, I don't fully see white's compensation. So that one looked okay for me. And if um, f3, for example, 
Uh, then the idea would be to, oh, right. Yeah, actually on uh, bishop g4, f3, sorry, I'm recording this like <laughs> a couple of days after the game, is actually planning to sacrifice the piece here. I was just going to take on c5. Um, now, if white recaptures, then I can like pull the, the bishop back. And I actually thought this position is not so bad for black, at least still somewhat playable because I maybe provoked f3. Um, but of course, on f takes g4, uh, the plan was to just recapture this one with the knight, and then I'm threatening to take on e3. I'm also threatening to just take more pawns on the queen side with c takes b4. And I actually felt like I'm getting a, a ton of pawns here for the piece, and that the position would be um, at least really, really messy. I really wasn't sure if I'm uh, better here, but I, I felt like I have reasonable chances because, like, white's extra piece somehow didn't feel super super convincing like bishop on g2 kind of biting on granite nine on h4 earlier was playing like a restrictive role but is not really doing that much uh and i if i can get like three pawns on the queen side and then maybe this like e3 pawn like i can get a lot of pawns for uh the piece so this one i i was going uh, definitely willing to go into um if the uh if the situation kind of presented itself um but okay white doesn't go c5 he just goes rook to e1 which I think was probably just a smarter move because he just kind of um, improves his position before going for bigger complications. And yeah, now black is just kind of suffering because of the lack of space. White just wants to go like h3, f4, e4, and black's pieces are going to run out of squares. Um, so I drop back knight ed7. White pushes f4. I was kind of expecting e4 first, but f4 also makes sense because this kind of threatens f5, and that's an annoying move to deal with. So I play knight b6. White goes e4. Uh, I played rook a d8 here. And now I'm just like kind of like a sitting duck. Like I'm just waiting for white to, to break with something. And I felt like the position at this point was incredibly dangerous for black. But yeah, what can I do? I'm just trying to make the best moves uh, I can find. Um, so here he goes f5, which I felt like was was very strong. Uh, I drop back bishop to c8. And, uh, and now c5. And yeah, this is kind of the, the, the combination of breaks. I was actually most worried about during the game. Um, because now the point after d takes c5 uh, is that maybe white can play e5 and, and just completely like roll black over in the center. Um, so I was looking at a lot of different lines here, but I ultimately didn't really have a choice. I had to take on c5 and um, he ends up just recapturing b takes c5. I was actually expecting e5 during the game and I, I felt like I must be in big trouble here, but at this point we're both like approaching pretty serious time trouble. So it's like, yeah, you, know, you just have to make the best moves you can find. But I, I think I was gonna go for um, knight g4 in this position. No, actually I think I was gonna play bishop h6 here. And, and then the idea was that if white takes on f6, I can take on e1 and it's a queen sacrifice, but we're also threatening to take on d2 felt like it's messy enough that black should hopefully have some chances at least. Like knight f1 I thought uh, might be forced. Then I can throw in bishop e3 check, king h1. And yeah, I felt like this position objectively probably uh, could be good for white. Um, because white is currently up material, has like queen and minor piece for the two rooks. But I also thought maybe there are some uh, small chances of uh, pulling off some kind of swindle. Maybe I'll get some rook d2 somewhere and uh who knows um but yeah ultimately i wasn't i wasn't feeling great about uh my chances i'm sure the engine um thinks black's play is close to ridiculous um but that was the plan and uh in the game white ends up just recapturing with the b pawn which i think also makes uh perfect sense and i could go back knight d7 here but then again i was worried about e5 and um, yeah, for me, uh, I think I missed this move knight g4 here that the engine was pointing out. Um, and uh, after f6, the point is that I can take on c5. So I actually saw this in a different variation, but didn't end up going for it. But yeah, it turns out that like tactically, somehow black is like surviving here, which uh, during the game, was not how I felt, right? It's just the engine saying like on f6, it turns out you have this tactic with queen takes c5, takes, knight takes, 
and then all of white's pieces on the second rank are, are hanging and black actually ends up having enough so this one i just didn't see i don't remember if i just didn't consider queen takes c5 like in this exact variation um but to me it just looked like it it's not not working out for black um and so i end up instead of knight d7 i end up going for this move bishop h6 um which to me just felt like the right thing to do because i'm just trying to create some counterplay, hitting the knight on d2, and at least not making it so easy for white. Um, so he goes knight f3, just defends, which I think was correct. And now I'm forced to go back knight d7. Uh, white goes e5. But because I got bishop h6 in, I felt like, well, at least now I'm not dealing with this f6 fork. So now maybe I have more options and I end up playing like knight d5 here. It turns out, again, this queen takes c5 shot was the best. Here I actually do remember considering this one during the game. Not for very long though, because I think at this point we were both like down to under five minutes pretty much. Um, and I saw that after takes, knight takes c5, um, if rook takes c5, then bishop takes d2. I think black is getting enough material because of the pin on, on the e-file. Um, but my issue here was that e takes f6 could happen. And I thought, okay, I can take on e1, rook takes c1, knight to d3. I can't take on d2 twice because uh, we get mated on the back rank. Um, but I can go knight d3 here, rook b1, bishop takes f5. I actually remember like calculating to this position and I was like, okay, I have a piece for two pawns. It looks kind of unpleasant for white, but you know, like to me, it didn't, it felt like I'm probably just going to be worse. Like I am down a piece. This f6 pawn could be really strong. But yeah, I really should have gone for this one because, I mean, it objectively was the best chance black could get. And yeah, really, like a lot of times these positions are quite difficult for the player with the extra piece because like a lot of stuff is hanging. Like the bishop is hanging, the rook is kind of under attack, the knight on d2 is under pressure. And uh, yeah, I have these like queenside uh, pawns. So if the queenside ever gets rolling, like, yeah, black could uh, potentially create some, some winning chances. So yeah, I really should have just gone for this one because... Um, during the game, I kind of felt like it's maybe not that bad for black. And then I played knight d5 in this position, just kind of like hoping for more, <laughs> but like objectively, I should have realized that like, you know, my position here is very suspicious and I, I should probably take my chances in that end game, which maybe is a, at least a little bit more, uh, more unclear. And the engine actually confirms that black is, um, in fact, equal <laughs> after like black has enough for equality here, which, okay. I wasn't thinking during the game, but. Yeah, I was feeling that it's at least uh, hard to handle for, from White's point of view. So e5, knight d5, uh, White now breaks with e6, which yeah, I thought was pretty strong. Um, I play knight f6 here, queen takes a4, uh, I took on e6, and at this point, yeah, we're just in like heavy time trouble, so we're, we're just like playing moves. I think we both have like a minute left with a 30 second increment. So, you know, these moves are basically just like the first moves that are coming to my mind. Um, but he pretty much outplays me here. It takes on g6, hg, queen h4. And uh, yeah, now my position is kind of like full of weaknesses and his pieces have a bunch of nice squares uh, to use. So I try to hold on, knight h5, uh, queen g4, king h7, knight e4. And I thought, okay, exchange sacrifice, totally correct. Uh, objectively, I think I probably should take this one. But uh, okay, it looked super, super dangerous to allow any kind of like knight g5 checks uh, with this bishop on <laughs> b2 and without a dark square bishop of my own. So I just felt like that's way too scary. Uh, I decide to play e5 to at least cover the diagonal and uh, open up this attack. Uh, now he goes knight g5 check, king back to g8, queen h4. And yeah, basically black's position here is just collapsing like bishop g7 takes on e5. I trade bishops, rook takes, queen f8. At this point, I'm, yeah, just trying to, like, hold on for dear life and just hoping, you know, praying for any any small little chance uh, in the future. But, um, yeah, 94. And unfortunately for me, it's just, like, uh, my position is just way too weak. Like, just too many weaknesses, too many things hanging, and, yeah, uh, no real counterplay. Um, so I decide to go bishop f5. I'm just, I don't know, developing my last piece, I guess, <laughs> 96. Uh, forced to take, knight takes e5. And uh, here I play knight df6. Uh, I kind of have to, or I felt like I have to make this move because I wanted to go like queen h6, at least look for any way of uh, activating the queen. But of course, rook is hanging, so I have to drop back. And uh, I realized he could play g4 here and um, fork the two pieces. But I, I figured, okay, at least I'm getting a little bit of 
something with rook takes like maybe i'll get one threat with rook takes d6 uh queen h6 unfortunately is met with g5 so that just doesn't work for black um so i sack the exchange takes queen takes uh white takes the bishop queen takes e5 and uh, now i have my one threat like queen e3 check <laughs> you know, hitting the rook uh, he goes queen c4 check king g7 and uh takes on g6 king takes g6 so we end up in this position and you know i actually felt like this wasn't the absolute worst outcome because earlier i felt like i'm probably like completely lost and maybe on the verge of getting mated and now we end up in this like weird end game where i have like two knights i have these pawns on the queen side i felt like okay i'm i should be dead lost but yeah uh at least the game is not over so that's something <laughs> at this point like yeah it's all you can really ask for is to just keep the game going and, and hoping for whatever chance uh you might get um and here I, I think my opponent did all the right things um rook f1 queen e6 just starts bringing all the pieces over to the king side and uh queen f3 i can't really trade queens because the the end game is uh, completely lost queen c5 check king h1 and uh, now the rook is coming to g1 and things are just getting really bad here so queen d4 uh he plays queen f5 check and uh, now i don't want rook g1 to come with check if king f7 there's queen takes h5 so king h6 uh rook g1 and yeah now it's basically over like i mean it's just mate on the board uh, being threatened so i have to like play queen d5 check and and trade queens uh so we trade queens rook to b1 and uh, now white just needs to kind of like pick off these queenside pawns and then we'll have enough pawns to uh to win the game uh, i played b6 here bishop d7 c5 uh, bishop c6 and yeah i thought about let's say going knight f4 here um but then i actually thought it's just very easy for white you can just trade off the bishop and go rook d1 and rook d6 and yeah i'm losing the b pawn already and yeah this just looked completely hopeless i mean the rook is just much stronger than the knight um, so I realized, okay, that's going to be too easy. So <laughs> I play knight e3. So I'm just like, okay, I have to, I have to make another move. At this point, we're still in like heavy, heavy time trouble. Um, so rook takes b6, and uh, then I play this move knight f4. And the only point of this move was to just try to like confuse the opponent because he has this like free discovered attack, but there's nothing to take. There's nothing on the light squares. So I just like maybe I'll waste some of his time looking for checks, and in the meantime, hoping to like activate uh, my knight. Um, so a4, white just starts pushing the a pawn. I go c4 because you know what else? Bishop b4 check, king to g5. And here, only here, I actually realized that I have a threat in this position. I have this. I, it's like a pattern I I don't think I've seen too many times before, if at all. But I am threatening to go knight h3 here, uh, and then the point is to go knight f2 check, and the king is actually trapped in the corner with the two knights. So I am threatening to just give. A perpetual with knight f2 and then knight back to h3 with check and white king is just stuck in the corner because this knight is covering the other squares so it's actually kind of funny i, I was like amazed like I, I actually have a threat and if king g1 trying to get out the king just doesn't get out this knight covers the uh, escape and we just immediately have a draw i mean maybe i can take the bishop as well i'm not sure but at least black has uh an immediate draw here um so i think at this point my opponent realize the threat um but he, he goes rook c6 and i play knight h3 and uh, now he goes bishop to g2 so he deals with the threat now on check king g1 i don't have knight h3 but i actually have some hope and, it, and so at this point this is where like you know the tension of the tournament really kind of settles in because of course this is like the last round you know there's like a lot of money on the line and yeah it's like my opponent was like winning the whole game he of course knew he was winning and now all of a sudden it's like all of a sudden it's gotten tricky i play knight f4 i'm like attacking the bishop and yeah i could just feel like the the nerves like kind of rising in in the moment which happens quite a bit in otb chess i think it's one of the hardest things to deal with is when it's like time trouble and there's like a lot at stake and it's like you have to just somehow try to keep your head and and, and try to stay focused uh, unfortunately for white he ends up blundering here he goes a5 I take on g2, um, he goes king g1 now. White well, could have just promoted this pawn. I'm not really in time. So on a6, knight f4, uh, he can't go a7 right away. This is a line I was desperately hoping for. <laughs> if a7, then knight h3, and white can promote, but then I get my perpetual and, uh, you know, I save the game. Um, but if white just throws in h4 check, 
and creates a square for the king, then black is essentially uh, just lost and can resign because now there's no more perpetual, white's a pawn just promotes, neither knight is in a position to stop the pawn, the rook is like perfectly placed, and uh, yeah, king takes a7 and black is just not in time uh, to do anything here. So yeah, white's like super, super close to winning here. He decides to go king g1, which I think is very understandable just to get the king out of the corner and uh, avoid this um, avoid this uh, threat of perpetual. And you can already tell it's like, you know, he gave up the bishop, like he didn't really have to, but it's like, yeah, just trying to avoid the mate and already it's like the pressure is uh, starting to build. Uh, so I go back knight f4, threatening uh, again the same perpetual, king f2, and uh, here I play knight g4 check. And, you know, I, I I already saw, like, okay, if he plays king f3, I have knight e5, and that's good. But I was like, okay, 0% chance, you know, this is happening. He's going to go, like, king e1 here. And then I was thinking maybe I go knight e5 and then hope for, like, knight d3 check. And, yeah, I think at this point, black is still just completely losing because the a pawn is much, much stronger than the c pawn. And my knights are just in no position here uh, to deal with the a pawn. Uh, but then all of a sudden, he goes king f3. And, uh, yeah, my heart kind of, like, skipped a beat. I was like, wow, I can't believe... Uh, that just happened and um yeah i mean it, it was very unfortunate he like realized like immediately that he he blundered uh and i played 95 check and it's, it's like i felt i felt terrible honestly like uh you know it's just like the worst thing that can happen to a chess player is like blowing a game that you were winning for like many hours you know and it's like a lot on the line and you blow it with, like you know the simplest mistake like you would never make this move in like any game and uh, yeah, just like one in a thousand chance. Um, so I felt very lucky, but you know, I still took the point because it's uh, competition. And after knight takes e6, you know, unfortunately for white, it's like I have one pawn left. <laughs> like I have enough to win the game. He's not able to like go after the pawn. Um, the knights are actually kind of blocking the king out. And yeah, black is just uh, completely winning. So game ended h4, king g4, a6. I pushed the pawn. King e3, knight d5 check, and uh, here white resigned because now, like, this knight can just defend the pawn forever, there's nothing the king can do about it, and I can just take this pawn, bring my king back, and, yeah, eventually uh, escort the c pawn home. So, uh, yeah, very, very uh, lucky win uh, for me, because it got me to six points out of nine, I ended up winning, like, a small prize, um, and, uh, yeah, ultimately a crazy game. Like, in my mind, I just kind of deserve to lose this one. And so when thinking about the tournament, like, my final score, I think, was kind of better <laughs> than my play, I think, deserved. Because uh, I definitely wasn't this unlucky in, in any of my losses. But as far as winning a game, like, yeah, I felt very, very fortunate uh, in this one. So really interesting tournament. I'll have to go back, I think, carefully through the games and, and try to kind of pick up on um, certain patterns of mistakes uh, that I made. I definitely felt like, you know, when I got a position that I really understood well, that I could uh, play it and handle it well. And if I got a position that I didn't understand so well, then I wouldn't handle it <laughs> that great. So definitely a lot to think about in terms of like what I should be studying and working on um, before the next tournament. But um, yeah, that's going to wrap it up for this series. Thanks to everyone who tuned in and uh, watched all the videos so far. I really appreciate all the support. Uh, definitely check me out on Chess Dojo's uh, channel if you haven't already. That's kind of where I'm doing all my main content uh, these days. And um, yeah, I'm not sure when is the next tournament I'll be playing. Uh, probably I'll be playing in Vegas again in December for the North American Open. But um, before that, I'm not sure if I'll be able to find another event or not. Um, but yeah, I'm going to keep working on the chess and hoping to do better in the future. Uh, hopefully I'll catch you in the next video and until then, take care.